Linda Langley with Transformations Unlimited, the program showcasing God's transforming power in the lives of individuals, communities, and even nations. I'm so glad you're with us today because we have a very special guest visiting with us from Southern California. We have Douglas Hamp, who is here from Costa Mesa. He is a um, researcher, Christian researcher, uh, author, um, uh, conference speaker, radio host. He's been on staff at uh, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa for eight years and taught at the School of Ministry there. We're very privileged to have him as our guest today on Transformations Unlimited. Would you welcome with me our guest, Douglas Hamp. Doug, welcome back to Grass Valley. It's Thank good you. to have you with us. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, we want to um, make you aware, first of all, of Doug's website, which is www.douglashamp.com. He has a variety of resources there, just a plethora of information and insight and revelation for you there, and we're going to be referring to that during the course of the program. Uh, but Doug, I'm interested in your personal testimony. You are a young man that God has obviously had his hand on and has taken to distant places and has blessed immensely in a number of ways, but I'd like to know how you came to know Jesus personally as your Savior and how he transformed your life. Well, I have to thank my parents for their, uh, just for their, their encouragement and their direction at a very early age. Uh, when I was about four, I gave my life to the Lord. Four, oh my and you know, as you kind of grow older, yeah. you, uh, you, you do it again, just to be yeah. sure, because you know, you're like, did I really do it? But I, I believe that I was saved at, at the age of four. Wow. Uh, I always loved Jesus. I liked to go for walks with Him and talk with Him. and So I had a, just a tender heart for the Lord and to... Um, to be with him and you know I'm so glad that he has continued to work in my life because mm -hmm. that very simple childlike -like faith that I had which is well, of course a wonderful thing he has taken me through various trials and tribulations mm -hmm. and and he's taught me a lot of things and you know my my biblical education has been part of that mm -hmm. but um, you know information in and of itself can kind of tend to puff you up right. so the Lord has had ways to to teach me other things as well mm -hmm. and how much I'm dependent on him mm -hmm. so regardless of what I know or don't know I know that I need the Lord and uh, he's the one that should, should receive the glory That's right. so I, I'm very thankful and I'm very thankful to my parents for, mm -hmm. for laying that good foundation mm -hmm. at an early age I, do, I definitely know that you have a mother who is an intercessor yeah. for you yeah. yeah I'm blessed in that way and contending for yeah. God's very best for you and your precious family Yeah. you know in the course of your education I know uh, that you are fluent in a number of, of languages and not very common languages. Uh, give us a little idea of, of how you acquired such a, a broad um, spectrum of language fluency. Well, uh, I've studied about nine languages. Uh, Spanish being my, uh, my, you know, my first, second language, if you want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, uh, your first, <laughs> second language, I like that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm very good at that. Mm -hmm. um, I did. I started in high school, and I went to Bolivia for a year uh, after college. I studied in college as well, uh -huh. and I've been teaching at this Spanish school of ministry for about eight years. Uh -huh. We just finished the semester, so uh, I was teaching there a, a number of topics, including theology and eschatology and such. But then I also went to Israel. Uh -huh. oh, I, sh I forgot to mention I, I studied French while I was at college. Okay. So you know, I, I I got decent at French. I spent a summer in France. Um, I would never call myself absolutely fluent, but I was, you know, I was okay. Uh -huh. And I also went to Italy, and because I knew Spanish and French, uh, Italian came fairly easily. Uh -huh. uh, the unfortunate part is that if you don't use the languages, they tend to just go away, uh -huh. which doesn't seem very fair. But uh -huh. like many things in life, they begin to atrophy. Right. So I wouldn't call myself fluent in all these anymore, but uh -huh. uh, at one time I was, you know, okay. Uh, and of course I went to Israel and You're I spent right. three years in Israel. I studied modern Hebrew and biblical Hebrew and uh, 
Then I also I, I studied Aramaic, Akkadian, which I don't recommend. I mean, some people are new Akkadian. <laughs> I thought it was just a painful process, quite frankly. Um, then I did Ar Arabic for a couple semesters mm. and Greek. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's everything. So but and Hungarian. I'm a fan. Hungarian. I almost forgot Hungarian. That. Yes, my that's wife right. is Hungarian. So. That's right. So. Yeah, so I hear that spoken all the time at, at home. And I lived in, in Hungary for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I. Um, well, I got maybe 50% fluency in Hungarian, mm -hmm. so I can hold my own and I can defend myself when they're talking about me at the dinner table. <laughs> <Right. You know? laughs> I, I chime in, but uh, so yeah, that's that's how I've come to learn those languages and, mm -hmm. and forget them as well. But uh, but the two languages, the Greek and the Hebrew, are the ones that have really given you the the tools and the key to search the scriptures and give you the yeah. insight and revelation that uh, you have you're receiving now. Right. Those are such foundational languages. Mm -hmm. When we come to the study of the of the scriptures, you know, it's not that you can't understand anything if you read it in English. I mean, mm -hmm. You certainly can understand a lot of stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I would be the last person to tell you that, you know, unless you read the Hebrew or the Greek, you don't get anything, because that's not true. And, uh, but you might think of it like this. It's kind of like listening to Beethoven's Fifth on a transistor radio. Oh. That's what it would be like reading simply in English. Mm -hmm. you, you get all the notes, right? Uh -huh. you, you hear the melody, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But then when you listen to a, a Dolby surround sound, now you hear a, a greater depth. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what it is to study the languages. Uh, you get the message very well in English. Mm -hmm. We have so many different translations, you can get the message. But if you want that, those, those deeper insights, they, they are many times to be found in either Hebrew or Greek. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes there's things in the translations that they're just hard to communicate. And there are a number of double entendres and, and various things, there are, you know, word plays and mm -hmm. whatnot that's happening in the language. Or sometimes the translator will see a word and he says, well, you know, this word really can mean, it's a very broad kind of idea, but he's forced to choose one particular word to translate that in English mm -hmm. and sometimes you lose some of the flavor. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the, the original languages has been very very beneficial in my life mm -hmm. and, and I just like to go back and look at the scriptures to believe that it, it should be taken literally mm -hmm. and the more that I take it literally my goodness the more things begin to jump out at me and I think we're in, we're in such an age where things that that previous generations would have said well this has to be Figurative. There's no way we can understand this to be literal. Now that we're in, you know, the we're in the uh, computer age, we're in the age of uh, genetics. A lot of things are becoming just obvious mm -hmm. that these should be taken literally. Yeah. I think of in Daniel uh, chapter 12, where it says that in the last days men will uh, knowledge will increase and men will run to and fro. Well, we see this happening, don't we? Right. I mean, uh, the fact that. You can jump in a car and drive 60 miles or 100 miles or you know 200 miles in a day. Right. This was unheard of. Uh, this would have been a you know a couple days or, or weeks trip mm -hmm. to, to to travel that far, especially with children, all the things that you take. Right. It's unheard of. And and now the amount of information that we have at our fingertips via the internet, and this is doubling every six months. Information is truly at such an uh, just an incredible rate, but. Looking at the scriptures, taking them literally, going back and, and digging into the original languages is, uh, it's very exciting. I, I love to do it. Yeah. So it's a privilege for me. And as I'm going through it, I'm, I'm digging, I'm like, Lord, really? This is really cool, you know? And I keep praying, Lord, show me the truth. That's all I'm interested in, uh -huh. is the truth of the word. I don't, I don't believe I have any ax to grind or agenda to prove, uh -huh. but I'm asking the Lord, what is true mm -hmm. because that's the only thing that matters that's you know right. if I can defend a particular thesis that's wrong what have I gained that's right nothing I mean I've gained nothing because I'm gonna stand before the Lord and he's like you know that theory you had that sounded really good and you convinced people <laughs> you were just dead wrong yeah all right so I know that I'm gonna answer to the Lord for everything that I do and I say and I write I'm gonna answer to him mm -hmm. so I keep that in mind and I and I take James 3 1 very seriously where it says, Brethren, let not many of you become teachers, for you will receive the stricter condemnation. Uh -huh. You know, I kind of fear and tremble when All I read right. that. I'm like, oh boy, I'm I'm responsible to do my homework and to really go and dig and see what the Lord has to say on the topic. Mm -hmm. And a very interesting principle that I've come across is what I call biblical triangulation. 
and it's kind of like when you have a cell phone and based on various towers you can pinpoint your position mm. well the same principle is true in scripture where it says that by the mouth of two or three witnesses a matter is established so if I can find a very minimum two verses better three or more mm. on a particular topic then I can take those and sort of lay them out in a circle you might think and where they converge that's where the true doctrine is mm. it's not only in one verse but it's in all of those verses taken together on a particular topic uh -huh. and then I say okay look at all these verses they're all pointing me to this conclusion and then we have a very strong doctrine to to build upon mm -hmm. is when we take all those together that's awesome and you know um, the joy in your discovery process comes across so clearly when you share you know the subject of your research and such so let's talk about the three books that you've written the first one was called discovering the language of jesus would you just share with our viewing audience a brief synopsis of that book and what you the conclusion that you came to in that book yeah well discovering the language of jesus is based on um it was really a, a professor that that got me into writing that book because somebody asked the question what language did jesus speak and he just off the off the cuff said, well, Aramaic, of course. And I went up to him later and said, you know, there's a lot of evidence that Jesus spoke Hebrew. And he said, oh, were you, you know, did they, uh, did they brainwash you over there in Israel? And I said, I don't think I was one who was brainwashed. Uh, it's, when you go back and you look at the scriptures, you see that Jesus spoke Hebrew. And I show that from, from the, the scriptures themselves, from extra biblical literature, from uh, historical records, and uh, and linguistic analysis. Mm -hmm. So it's it, uh, Jesus spoke Hebrew. Did he also speak Aramaic? Well, possibly, though we have no positive record of that. But that was one of the languages in the land today. If you go to Israel, you'll find that that you know Israel as a whole is speaking about four different languages. You've got Hebrew as the the uh, national language, followed by English, uh, also Arabic, and Russian. So four languages are being spoken, and very often an average Israeli will speak two or three or maybe even four languages. Wow. And, you know, it's a little hard for us Americans to understand that because we usually speak one language. Right. But that's very common over there. So I'm showing that Jesus spoke Hebrew as his mother tongue when he was speaking to the, the crowds, he was speaking to his disciples, he was speaking Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And that was the language of his communication for mm -hmm. the most part. Uh, my second book is the first six days confronting the God plus evolution myth. And there I show that God created in six literal days. Very simple, it's a very simple premise. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that it's literal days, it's not day ages, it's not theistic evolution, it's not progressive creation, but God did it in six literal days. You know, quite frankly, God took a long time to create the heavens and earth. Can you believe he took six whole days yeah. to create the heavens and earth? I mean, my goodness, that's a long time for God. Yeah. He could have snapped his divine fingers and been done with the whole thing, and yet he decided to take six days, plus one, of course, for rest, to, you know, to stop, and uh, thereby giving us a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, God in his wisdom decided to do that in six days. He didn't have to, but he did, uh, primarily to give us a uh, a model to live our lives by. Mm -hmm. And we have in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, it says, For six days you shall work and rest on the seventh, because the Lord God created in six days the heavens and earth, and all therein, and on the seventh he rested. Mm -hmm. So just as we have six days plus one, we understand that I'm not going to work for six billion years and then take a billion years <laughs> right. off. That's yeah. not much of a deal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'd rather take six days and get a day off, <laughs> literal right. days, right? And so, therefore, God did it in six literal days, and then he rested on the seventh day. Mm -hmm. Some of the issues that you talk about there in the first six days address, uh, you know, some of the questions that people have regarding dinosaurs and, you know, ev so-called evidence that some people use to, uh, you know, establish uh, their case for evolution. Would you just discuss that briefly? Well, yeah, that's... That's one of the, the, the so-called problems is that if we believe in a literal six days and that God created roughly 6,000 years ago, then the big objection is what about those dinosaurs? Uh -huh. So I, I talk about that in the yeah. book and I show that actually dinosaurs are in the Bible. Uh -huh. Now do we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Of course not. Uh -huh. Because the word dinosaur was not even invented. It wasn't coined until 1841 by Dr. Owen uh -huh. who uh, was one of the first to discover these these very big bones, uh, 
you know, the type of lizard, but different than your average lizard. Mm -hmm. And so they were called terrible lizards, all right? Dinosaurus is oh. what they were called, uh, terrible lizards. And so we're not going to find that word, dinosaur, in the Hebrew scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it wasn't invented until 1841. But we do find other words. We find the word taninim, which is a type of uh, aquatic dinosaur, which we'd call the plesiosaur and those types of, of uh, you know, they're technically not dinosaurs, but, you know, they're close enough, same family. Uh -huh. Then we have uh, the mention of behemoth mm -hmm. in Job yeah. chapter 40. Right. And I talk about how that was uh, an excellent description of a sauropod dinosaur. Mm -hmm. In fact, that one, because God says it has a tail like a cedar tree, that was probably the Diplodocus dinosaur. The Diplodocus dinosaur's tail measured 46 feet long. Oh my goodness, wow. But you know what's so crazy is that so many translations will have in the notes, uh, it'll say elephant or you know hippopotamus or something. I mean, I've seen the tail of an yeah. elephant. It's a big fly swatter. Yeah. It's not at all a cedar tree. <laughs> that's right. It does not remind me of a cedar tree. That's right. And I don't think it reminded God of a cedar tree either. That's right. You know, I mean, he's the one who's giving this incredible description. Description, right. He's like, look, Job, I made behemoth along with you. Uh -huh. And he's got a tail like, he moves his tail like a cedar. Uh -huh. You know, God's not stupid. I mean, he's the creator after all. He knows yeah. what he's talking about. And if you look at the tail of a diplodocus, 46 feet long, that looks like a cedar tree. Uh -huh. Cedars are between 40 to 60 feet, 60 feet tall. So that's an excellent description. And then there's even Leviathan. Now there's a really exciting one. Uh -huh. And you know, I'll be quite frank with you. When I first really read that in, in, in all seriousness, I was a little bit embarrassed. I thought, why would God put a fire-breathing dragon in the Bible? Because obviously this is mythological, uh -huh. right? And you know, I did more research and, I, and I'm indebted to uh, Kent Hovind. He, uh, he opened my eyes a lot on uh, evolution and such, and I, I discovered that this Leviathan, this fire-breathing dragon, was real. Wow. He said, well, that's a thing of myths and fairy tales and all this stuff. Well, sometimes myths have a, a bit of truth in them, don't mm -hmm, they? They do. And, you know, and if God can create the bombardier beetle, I mean, that's a pretty weird bug. Mm -hmm. right? It takes these two uh, chemicals and puts them together and then shoots it out of its rear end and it makes this explosion and it gets away from the spider as a result of that. Uh, you creative. Huh? Oh, I know, you know. You, you've got uh, you've got fireflies. That's right. pretty cool. Yeah. You have glow in the dark jellyfish. Mm -hmm. Not only are they glowing in the dark, but the lights are actually moving. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So if God can do those types of things, I'm right. sure he can make a fire-breathing dragon. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I could probably make a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> uh, you know, you just take two chemicals, you find some kind of ignition, and voila, you've got a fire-breathing dragon. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's not inconceivable that this kind of creature uh -huh. would exist. And God is boasting about it. Mm -hmm. he, he says, this creature doesn't know fear, mm -hmm. doesn't know what the word means. So there we have, you know, dinosaurs in scripture, right. very clearly. Uh, and God is, is very proud of these creatures. They're amazing. They're unlike any other. Mm -hmm. So when I began to see all these things, and again, I was taking the scriptures literally. literally. Mm -hmm. And the more I would take them literally, the more details I would see. I think we have a tendency to say, well, this has to be figurative language. Mm -hmm. And the moment we begin to do that, I think the amount of revelation God wants to give us is going to go down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not that I'm any genius, but I'm just looking at the scriptures. I'm mm -hmm. saying, Lord... Help me understand this. Mm -hmm. Show me what you're actually saying here, because I don't understand it, quite frankly. Right. But I'm going to work on the principle that I should be taking this literally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, very often it's been a revelation for me mm -hmm. that as I go and I, I dig into the scriptures and I say, well, how can this be? And then I begin to educate myself on what is known in, you know, man's science, uh, what's truly known, not just what is speculated, uh -huh. and, and then compare it with the scriptures. I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. Mm -hmm. So that's been a, that was a very exciting, uh, very exciting study, and um, so I, I just encourage people to take the scriptures literally. God has great things in there. He's not he's not joking around when he says that he made behemoth whose tail was like a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's God after all. Right. He doesn't need to exaggerate. And I like your approach that we can all really. Um, take on as we read the Bible to just say, Lord, open my eyes, show me, you yeah. know, the reality of your word and, and make it real to me. Open my eyes that I can see, uh, you know, what you place before me. That's just a good position and posture to be in wh whenever we sit down to read the word. Mm -hmm. but let's transition now to your last, uh, your most current book called Corrupting the Image. Well, Corrupting the Image, 
uh, I started writing that because I kept noticing in the scriptures the, the whole notion of, of, of the seed. and What is a seed? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you kind of think you know something until you begin to try to describe it. And uh, I, I started looking on the internet, what is a seed? I was looking at this, I was looking at watermelon seeds and, and sunflower seeds, thinking, okay, I know what a seed is, right? But then I started doing research, and I'm like, what actually makes this thing tick? Why is this growing when we put it in the ground? What's inside there? There has to be some set of, of instructions or something. Because I, I read about the, the, the husk and all the stuff on the outside, but I'm like, that's not it. Then I began to, to dig further, and I found, uh, of course, you, you, you come across uh, chromosomes. Then you hear about the, the, uh, the genes, and then finally to the DNA. I think, okay, I think I'm getting somewhere. It's mm -hmm. a really DNA that's inside of, a, of a, a, a seed. But then I discovered something else, and it was when I read the book, In the Beginning Was Information by Dr. Werner Gitt. Very interesting book. And what he was talking about is that information is a non-material entity and it requires some kind of a medium, a physical medium to be to be stored in. Mm -hmm. So you might think of it like chalk on a chalkboard, he says, where the chalk and the chalkboard are the physical medium used to to store the information that you have up here in your brain and then you use that to, to just transfer that and to store it. Mm -hmm. We might think of it like a CD-ROM. A, a CD-ROM is a piece of plastic and maybe cost a few pennies but we can put on all kinds of important information in there. You might put your, your family's photo albums. You might put uh, some incredible software that took you years and years and years to write. Uh, you know, you can buy uh, some pretty amazing and sophisticated software that might cost you $1,000 or more, and it comes out of a little simple CD-ROM. It's not the plastic we care about. It's the information mm -hmm. that's on that piece of plastic. That's mm -hmm. really what we're looking at. So that was my big aha moment when I discovered that it's the information that's inside a seed that is really what we're talking about. You know, God is the one who made the seed. Mm -hmm. But you say, well, that's not what Scripture is talking about when it talks about seed. Well, what else would it be talking about? God is the one who made the seed. He certainly meant to talk about what He put in there. He put the information in there. He put the, the double helix and the nucleic acids. He did all that inside the seed. So He's the genius behind the seed. Mm -hmm. And then I came across the word uh, gamete. I thought, oh, well, maybe that's a better description of what we really should be talking about. But it turns out the word gamete is just a Greek word. It means marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm not getting anywhere. A lot of the terms that we use are no better than the word seed. Mm -hmm. So you kind of go back to the word seed. Well, what about, what about you know, sperm or something? Well, that's just a Greek word. It means seed. Mm -hmm. And we find that when we look at the Greek scriptures, we see that the word sperm or, or uh, sperma is in there, and it's just talking about what, um, you know, that's <laughs> talking about a seed. So, the bottom line of a seed is the DNA, and inside the DNA is information. Mm -hmm. And with that in hand, I began to understand a lot of things. And the premise of my book really is Genesis 3.15, where God says, I will cause enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And once we understand that, that we're talking not simply about the passing out of a physical seed, okay, mm -hmm. but we're talking about the, the transference of information. Mm. Then it all begins to make sense. Wow. And, and it really is this, you could think of the Bible as a story of two seeds. Mm. You've got the seed of the Messiah who would come and set things right, but what about that seed of the serpent? Right. And that serpent, we're told in Revelation chapter 20, is Satan, the devil, that ancient dragon, right? That's, that's who that we're talking about mm -hmm. there. So how could it be that he also has a seed? Well, once we understand that it's a non-material entity, it's information wow. that we're talking about. And what I saw there is that the promise of Satan's seed is the Antichrist. So, and then I detail all that in my book of, you mm -hmm. know, what, you know, what happened, what happened in the days in the past, in the days of Noah, and what's happening today. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as looking at the genetics of the Incarnation, and uh, you know some of the things that I shared the other day was uh, the image of God. That's right. really the foundation of this whole thing mm -hmm. of understanding who God is, what he, what Scripture describes Him as, and how He has this fire and electricity coming out of Him. Uh, how how He created us there in the beginning. What was lost? What is regained at the point of salvation? Mm -hmm. At the point of getting our new bodies? How we're going to have these bodies of light 
that are going to you know, just be emitting light when in the presence of God. Very exciting stuff. I mean, exciting. I think that's the most exciting part of the book, quite frankly, because uh -huh. uh, that has to deal with, with me. You know, I'm excited about my new body. Uh, it's also exciting what we see happening on you know, the dark side, as it were, but, mm -hmm. but that's a little bit, you know, a little downer, you know, it's kind mm -hmm. of dark. And I, I like the, the hope that we have that the Lord gives us. But it all, it all fits together as, as one big package because it gives us the, the bigger overview of what happened, what the Lord promised, what the Lord did for us, and what Satan is trying to counterfeit. That's mm -hmm. really what is happening. Mm -hmm. He's trying to counterfeit our salvation. Mm -hmm. And it's going to lead to the rise of the Antichrist. It's going to lead to the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. And it all goes back to that verse there in Genesis 3.15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is amazing. And you know, Doug, we just have a minute or so left. And uh, if you would just share with our viewing audience, if say someone's been sparked by you know, the, the things that you've shared and they would like to inter invite you to come and minister at that church, uh, at, at their church, how would they contact you? And what are some of the things that you could share what that you have uh, pre prepared to uh, share and teach about? Well, uh, you can go to my website, douglashamp.com, and I, I have a contact uh, form there. So please write to me. I do answer the emails. And I'd, I'd love to come out and speak. I have, um, I forget exactly how many I have, probably about 15 different presentations that I, that I have prepared already. And I have a list there of the things that you can, you can choose from. I'm happy to talk about any one of my books or other topics that I've I've done presentations on, and they're all prepared for about a 50-minute presentation time. Mm -hmm. That's usually what most uh, church times or group times are last for, about 50 minutes. So I, I really keep it within that, that time frame. If somebody is interested in having a, a conference, I certainly can expand it. There's a mm -hmm. lot I can say Definitely. on any one of these topics, but uh, just for brevity, I, I try to keep it very short. And uh, I'd love to. It's, it's a real honor for me to come and to share the things that God has been showing to me and then to share it with others. Mm -hmm, yes. Well, uh, hard to believe it. Our time is almost up here, and we do want to encourage you to avail yourself of the materials that Doug has on his website. There are a number of videos that are also available there where he has shared uh, some of these concepts in different venues, and you could uh, check those things out. We would just encourage you to order the books. They are uh, revolutionary in terms of, of your thinking, and it will change your perspective on uh, the Bible and God, and, and perhaps just break away some of those uh, old mindsets that we have so comfortably fallen into. And we just want to encourage you to check out again the website, douglashamp.com. Thank you for being with us today on Transformations Unlimited. Check out our website, which is www.transformu2.org. And God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next week on Transformations Unlimited. Jesus, there's no God.